Philippians chapter 3, we're going to begin the 12th verse. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is a reading from God's word. Please be seated. There are many in here that played sports or took exams or sought the honor roll or various things that are set before us. Positions at work. And we have that desire to what? Better ourselves, win a crown, win a victory. You know, there's nothing like competition, especially if you're a competitor, right? <laughs> and if you're a competitor, you want to run according to the rules. You want to do the things necessary in order to what? Obtain a prize. And Paul gives us this illustration uh, that points to those who ran a race. You know, and as I was thinking about this, I remember uh, I had a running race many, many moons ago when I looked like a runner. And I had two races. One was a sprint, which I miserably lost. I mean, literally, I was, it looked like I never got off the, the starting line when all of a sudden, Everybody won. And I mean, I heard hisses and everything else. And I was like, I didn't think I was going to lose. But I lost, and I lost so bad. Well, what ends up happening was it produced a diligence in me. Because the next race was the cross country. So in order for me to get ready for that cross country, what do you think I did? I decided to practice. Practice, not rely on, oh, I know I could do this. I wanted to make sure I could do this. And at that time, there was a guy who became famous in the Olympics. His name was David Waddle. I don't know if you remember Dave Waddle, but he, used to, he was the only guy that I remember that used to wear a cap when he would run. And he had this way of running that when he started off, he was all the way in the back of the line. And he was just just going his merry way. And it looked like he was just on tour watching all this crowd. And he was just going subtle. But then he would just keep going and going and going and going. Ultimately, he's passing this guy, passing this guy. And then you hear the commentator saying, look at him. Look at the way this guy is moving. He's passing this guy. And ultimately, he won. So that was my role model to look at. So as I'm practicing, I used to go down this. There was a school called Monoese School. And they had this big, big hill. So I would go to the bottom of the hill and run up and then walk down the hill and then run up to build leg strength. And then I would run through the woods so I could build endurance and jog around. Then I went to the course and thinking about David Waddle, I said, I need to have a point where I could start my sprint. But if I come to that point where I'm going to start my sprint, I better make sure I'm able to finish it without running out of breath. Because you could run out of breath. So what I did was I would practice and practice. And every time I hit that, I would maximize my speed and go until the point was I was able to do it with steps ahead. And then came the day for the race. 
Never forget it. And we were all ready, and nobody figured I was even going to do it. But I wasn't good at a sprint. The 100-yard dash, I found it, that wasn't it. And I wasn't as full of confidence, but I knew what I had to do. I did win that race. I actually won that race. And when I got to that point, which was a good distance, and I broke free, I saw some people slow up and quit, something like what I did. Then when I won, of course, I wasn't, it wasn't, everybody didn't think I was going to win, and I wasn't expected to win, so whoever was supposed to win, but I won. And that was the last time, you could tell, that I ran any length of time in that position. <laughs> But the reason why I brought that illustration out is when we look at the doctrine that we're getting from the book of Philippians, look at Philippians chapter 3. We're going to go back to um, verse 9 where Paul says that, you know, he wants to know Christ. He wants to know the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. He said, I'm willing to suffer the, for the things, the loss of all things, to count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Then in 9, he says, I want to be found in Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now that he knows that the righteousness that he has is solely by faith alone. It's not in his works of merit that he thought he had by obeying the law. He accepted that righteousness that comes from God that's by faith. He's not content to stop there. He continues, that I may know him. See, he wants to know more of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. That I may attain by any means possible the resurrection from the dead. He even wants to be conformed to his sufferings. And when you consider these two lines of Paul, how he says, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And last week, we talked about how many of us miss the experience of the power of his resurrection when we don't desire or are unwilling to suffer for his sake. We miss that. And when we miss that, we miss one of the crowning works of God's grace in our lives when we endure these things. It's an experience, like I, I, I mentioned last week, that you will see your hell by the power of God as you endure these trials. So when Paul says that he wants to share in his sufferings, he wants to become like him in his death, Christian, there's two ways we become like him in his death. The outward experience, which is when we carry our cross, we proclaim Christ, and we receive the persecution and things along that line. Then the inward part of dying with Christ, where we die to sin on a daily basis. Because with the Holy Spirit and being placed in Christ in his death, uh, we, we also have died with Christ. So you have the inward and the outward, which we'll elaborate more in a, in, a, in a future sermon. Then he says in verse 11 that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Has nothing to do with any doubt here. It has to do with the difficulty each one of us faces in our course. That by any means, whether it's suffering, whether it's dying more and more to my daily self, by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. How does he go about to do that? He says, first off, he reminds us. He says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this. Paul hasn't already obtained the fullness of the experience of Christ's resurrection power. Nor has he already been made perfect. See, Christian, there is no chance in this world, as long as we are living in the presence of sin, and we still carry the old carcass of Adam with us, that we're going to ever reach perfection. It's utterly impossible to reach perfection. Yet, Christian, there's that desire to be that way, isn't it? It's that desire. And when we fall short, 
We could come in our daily confessions. We could come as a church on Sunday morning, bemoan the past week, and confess our sins corporately and privately, knowing when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a beautiful thing that, you know, that our Lord Jesus does for us? And the fact that we sang that song, Turn Your Eyes Onto Jesus, it doesn't get better than this. So don't bemoan the fact that you fall. But look forward to what he has in store for us. Because it's easy to look back. And then we tend to stumble all the time. So he says, but I press on. Notice this. I press on to make it my own. To make the experience of that resurrection. To make that experience of sharing in his sufferings. To make that experience of becoming like him in his death. For he already had the righteousness of God in him by faith alone. He already had that. That's a done deal. But now it comes into that sanctification process where God works in us both the will and to do. It's that perseverance. And Paul uses the word, but I press on. And you know, when you, when you hear that, you have to understand the Philippians had to have one of those coliseums in that area where they had races and different things because it's projecting to them an imagery that this church was well aware of because Paul doesn't elaborate and name certain runners or racers like I did in, in my discourse at, earlier in the sermon but he says but I press on to make it my own how do we do that in life how do we press on to make things our own well, some of us had the, have built a house or rented an apartment and wanted to what? Make it our own. And we put things together to make it our own and say, this is what? My home. My home. But he's doing it for something that's eternal, right? But he says, I press on to make it my own. He says in verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But there's one thing he does do. And the one thing he does do is this. He forgets what lies behind. And there's such an easy tendency, and Satan fuels this, you remember when you did this, or you remember that, or you remember, and he brings to your memory all these past things. And these past things Satan uses to make us wonder, can I really be saved? But see, the minute we think that way, we have fallen to the pattern and have forgot that God doesn't justify the godly. He justifies the ungodly, the sinner. We forget that Jesus Christ came into the world to save who? Sinners. Of whom every one of us can say, I'm the top notch, right? But he says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. See, now notice it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Now there's an intensity. You see that? There is an intensity. There is a goal. There is an outcome. There is a desire, a, a strong desire, Christian, to what? To make him our own and to set our eyes where? Where we are going to be. He continues. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So if you look at these words in verse 12, I press on to make it my own. Verse 13, I strain forward. When you think of straining forward, think of that runner who's in that tight race. And what is he doing? To win the race, he what? He pushes himself forward to win. It's like a horse race. You know when the horse is racing and, and the jockey who's like five foot nothing and he's maybe 110 pounds because he wants to be as light as possible or she wants to be as light and they push that thing forward and you just win by a nose. See the intensity of it. The question we want to ask ourselves is where is our intensity in our time of sojourning here is our ten is our intensity like that of the apostle well he says this in verse 15 let those of us who are mature think this way now when we come to christ and he gives the holy spirit 
There's things that he teaches. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does teach us is the wiles and schemes of who? Satan. And one of the things that I've learned from the evil one is this. He would have us think, I am not mature even when I'm 60 or 70 or 80. But let's put it on a plain level where we, we're at. Some of us will be rearing children someday. Some of us have been children. I think all of us have been children at one time. You know, and some of us have raised children. And there's one thing I noticed that each person in existence does thrive for with a sober mind. Maturity. I want to grow up. Now, of course, if my wife was here, she might say, when, do, when are you going to start, Mark? <laughs> but there's that element where you turn 16, what do we want? We want that first car. We want that GTO or that 57 Chevy or whatever our favorite car was, that Dodge with a Hemi or that pickup truck, or we want to be able to dye our hairs or whatever it is that we desire to do at that time. But there's that wanting to be older, wanting to grow up. You know, the desire of our parents to say, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to move out? Things along that line. Um, you know, and it's something that happens naturally. Now, Satan would have us not think, well, I've been walking with Christ for 30 years, but I'm still not mature enough. That's why what Paul says, and he puts it out in a prayer, because we need God. We need to ask him. So he says this, he says in verse 3, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything, if you think otherwise, and the potential is there, that's why the Holy Spirit made sure these words were penned for us, God will reveal this also to you. Now, you've got to hear these words. God will reveal this to you. And you want to know why? See, how many of us sometimes will come before the throne room of grace and pray? And sometimes we don't know what we ought to say. We don't know what we ha tend to ask. Sometimes it's just on the material things and we forget certain things. We do have the Holy Spirit who groans and makes intercession for us. But our goal is, well, what did you say on my behalf? What did you say for me on my behalf? The Lord Jesus Christ said, ask and what? You will receive. Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians says, what is God's will for our lives? Our sanctification. Now let's put the two together. We know it's God's will for our sanctification. So we pray to abstain from sexual immorality and various things. And we know he hears us because why? We ask according to his will. See, and faith believes this. We believe this, right? He says it. This isn't me saying, Mark wills that you... No, this is God himself saying, if you think in anything otherwise, God will reveal. So Lord, reveal to me my immaturity. Reveal to me my foolishness. Be, reveal to me my eyes that are always cast down, looking at the path in front of me, and open up my eyes so I can see the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Enable me to strain. Enable me to run with intensity. Enable me to grasp hold of what you have laid hold of. You have laid hold of me. And this all goes back, right? This all goes back, folks, to this point where he says, I make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. It doesn't get better than this. Christ Jesus has made his people his own. Man, if that doesn't grow hair on a bald head, I don't know what would. <laughs> you know, because in, in essence, the only reason why is because look what Jesus did. He laid hold. You know how he laid hold? He grabbed you. Bam! Picked you up. He laid hold of you. And you know what? You cannot break out of that grip. That is a grip that, you know, you can't get out of. Whether you can think of grips from George the Gip for Notre Dame or the, the ferocious attack of Lawrence Taylor and that menacing grip, this is the grip of God where no one, no created thing could snatch us out of his hand. Is that a sigh of relief? 
all because Jesus laid hold of us. Now I could understand, right? We could understand when Paul says in verse 8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. <laughs> you know, the, the idea there that he's willing to count things lost for the sake of Christ, that all he wants is Christ. He even desires in Philippians 2, I desire to be with Christ, which is far better. Why? Does this world offer us joy, contentment, hope, every single day how many of us see the deaths of our loved ones experience it in our own lives see the various ailments that are common to a fallen nature in a fallen world not knowing what to expect that's why our sovereign lord in his wisdom says don't worry about what tomorrow worry about the day at hand it's got enough troubles <laughs> it's got enough troubles let's listen to dad <laughs> And we can call him dad because as we call him our father who art in heaven, we can come with that humble approach and approach him because of who? Because Jesus Christ laid hold of us. He laid hold of us. And then he considers in verse 16, he says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. See, all of us on this journey have attained to a certain level. There's our starting point. Let's hold on to what we have. But now, folks, let's build on that. Let's continue. Let's build on that. And how do we do that? Well, you know what Paul does? By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me. Join in imitating me. So now we have a fellow human being, a fallen creature, too, at it. At it. He says, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. These are words of encouragement. Why are these words of encouragement? Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2, the apostle reminds us, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every... We have examples. We have examples from Father Abraham had many sons, right? We have examples. We had Moses. We have all those whom God has called out. We have examples. These examples are flesh and blood like we are. Needy of God's grace. Struggling under sin. Various things. He says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. You know why sin clings so closely? We're born with it. It sticks to us because it's our nature. It's a difficult thing because what you have naturally in your body, it's hard to understand that you're not supposed to be this way. You know, you ever, you ever consider? See, and then when God says, hey, <laughs> that's because of Adam. <laughs> the natural disposition of man is to say, but it's fun. Everybody does it. I mean, look around us. But the apostle says, I want you to look around somebody else. I want you to keep your eyes here. A matter of fact, I'm going to lift your eyes after you see the examples that our brothers and, you know, and sisters have. He says this. Look, we're going to have every weight in sin. We're, we're to lay that low. We're to lay it aside. But then he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do we all realize that we have been placed in a race? A race that we will win but a race in which there, there might be a couple of hurdles in the way. <laughs> There's going to be some difficulties. But who do we look at for the goal? Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. See, he says in verse 14 of Philippians 3, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So our eyes 
must always be fixed. Always turn your eyes upon Jesus. Always. So we're to look to Jesus. Why? Because he is the founder, the author, the perfecter, the completer of our faith. And he says, who for the joy that was set before him. What joy was set before? The cross. The joy set before Christ was the cross because he was dying. He was dying to save a people unto himself, enabling us to die to sin, to crucify the flesh. I mean, Jesus <laughs> did this. And that's why Paul could say that I may know him the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death so that we too could have joy that we too could see this is meant for my good boy it's difficult boy this is hard but plead plead your case Thomas Bilney not many of us remember good, good old Thomas but he stood up for the scriptures for faith against the church a tyrannical church and at first he recanted but then the Lord convicted his heart and then they marched him off to be burned and he stood there and he took it with strength a strength that he did not have because you know what he did the night before Mr. Billney he saw a candle and he put his hand over the candle and he quickly went like this it's hot you ever do that I'd done that, you know, just to try it out. And boy, that hurts. So you know, the night before, the very morning, he had to march down knowing what was gonna happen. And he endured the flames. And he had joy. And the only reason why, because it attests to what? The power of his resurrection. You and I naturally can't do this. I could never put my hand over, over and, and we can't. But the Lord kept his promise. See, God is faithful. And he enabled him to endure that. And that's a confidence each one of us ought to have. God is faithful. He will do what he says. And our prayer should be what? That I may know him, the power of his resurrection. But folks, be willing to say the next line. Because it's about dying too. Remember when Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross. If you desire to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you desire to lose your life, he doesn't just say do that, just sits back and say, let's see you do it. No, he's given you God power. <laughs> Resurrection power that could take a dead body three days. Three days dead and resurrect it back to life. That power he gives us. So look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Where do we look towards the upward call of God in Christ. Where is Christ seated? At the right hand where all power and authority, all dominion is in his hand. That tells us, folks, that no matter who's with you, who's against you, what you face in this world, right? Whatever you face, he's the sovereign one. He ordains everything that comes to pass. Whatever he puts in our life, take confidence. It is either meant to bring you home to glory or it's either meant to conform you to his son, to wake us up out of a slumber, to cause us to look more to him because everything he does has the benefit that benefits his children. But we also want to consider one last point. You notice when Paul says that he presses on he strives and strains with an intensity and then goes back to pressing on toward the goal. That word press is the exact same word that he uses in verse 6. As the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as the righteous under the law, blame. You see that word persecutor? That's the same word. Now, let's look at this example. 
Remember when Paul, what kind of zeal did he have? <laughs> what straining was he doing? Well, he wanted to destroy this movement. He wanted to destroy Jesus. So he went into homes, and what does the scripture say? And he ravished these homes. I mean, literally, the men went in there and ripped things apart, grabbed the people, children crying. I mean, this was pretty ferocious. That same word is the same word when he says, I press on toward the goal. What, is it, what, what Christian are we to strive and press on towards? What, what is it that is so much a part of us that we got to get in there, lay it aside, lay the weight that's so easily. Let's tie all these in. What is it? Let's go to the head of the church, Jesus. In Mark chapter 7, verse 20, he tells us exactly what's in us. The disciples came and they did something that I've done for many years, but my mom is not around anymore to tell me. I don't wash my hands before I eat. And I, you know, and that's, well, now I do. <laughs> but, and, but there was a customary that, oh no, that's uncleanliness. And Jesus just wanted to correct something. It is good etiquette, though, to wash your hands before you eat. We learned that during this COVID. There's nothing better than washing our hands, right? But he says this, it's what comes out of a person is what defiles that person. For from within, now I want us to see, now let's look at this as a mirror. Let's put this as a mirror because what Jesus is going to do is he's doing us the biggest blessing and grace and faith. He's shown us us. For from within, out of the heart of a human being, come evil thoughts. How many of us have evil thoughts? Isn't that pretty much a fabric in our being? How easy is it to have evil thoughts? How easy is it to have evil thoughts of someone who tries to correct you, a father to a son? We say things about our dad. <laughs> Sexual immorality. And what does our world feed us with? A massive a dote of these, uh, uh, amount of these things. Theft. Well, you know, I never stole anything from anybody. How about at work? Union rules break is 10 minutes. Sometimes we take 15, 20. And then we even justify our own thoughts by saying, well, he's still making money. <laughs> it's amazing how we become Perry Masons on these things. Murder. Now, murder just isn't tied to the actual murder as our Lord himself taught. We can be so angry with a person that sometimes we may lay on our bed and plot something. Look at how wicked we could get, right? Adultery. Coveting. What did Paul say? I would have never have known coveting unless what? The law says it. And how was he able to know that coveting was a sin because the Spirit of God was within him? Deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, even gossip. How hard is it to keep our mouths shut? When we hear a story, it's almost like a juicy morsel. I can't wait. Hello. And it goes on. And <laughs> Look it up. Now, do we get a good picture now? Praise God, not all of them, I don't think, it's in all of us. But, do we just see a mirror in front of us? See these weights that could be on us? These weights that constantly bring us down and how the apostles, lay them aside. Run the race with endurance. He says, all these things come from within, they defile a person. The apostle gives us a commentary. Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. The works of our Adamic nature, our old man, our flesh, our sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And things like these I have warned you as I have warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Strive by his power. How do we strive on our own? No, because what else do we have? If you, by the spirit of God, put to death the deeds of the body, what? You will live. He has given us his spirit. And 
we can also approach him. He is approachable in Christ. And we can, and we can understand like the psalmist in Psalm 19.12, who can discern his errors? Who could declare me innocent from my hidden faults? See, I don't know your hidden faults. You don't know my hidden faults. But you know who does know our hidden faults? He who sees the hearts. He who sees the hearts. So we come before him and we say, Lord, open our eyes to see us. Where do we get that from? Isaiah chapter 42, 16. The Lord says, I will lead the blind by a way they did not know. I will guide them on unfamiliar paths. See, the paths that we are on are natural to man. These sins are natural to man. But God will lead us on an unfamiliar path, but He will not leave us on that unfamiliar path alone. He will never leave us or forsake us. He says, I will turn darkness into light before us. And you know the benefit of having light walk before us than dark? We can see where we're going. And the rough places... We will endure rough places, folks. He'll turn them into level ground. These things I will do for them. And he says, and I will not forsake them. As the apostle said, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. He has blessed us by giving us his word giving us examples but most of all he has given us himself he's laid hold of us and because he's laid hold of each one of us let's press on forward let's strive with an intensity and above all press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of god in christ jesus Amen.